The Korean War is often forgotten about on the world stage, overshadowed by World War II and the Vietnam War. Few people even know that the war is technically ongoing since neither side has signed a formal agreement to end it. They've only agreed to a ceasefire. Should we know more about a war that's been raging at various intensities for more than 70 years? We would argue yes. To understand the war better, we'll be discussing a battle that few have heard of outside of Korea, despite the fact that it changed the course of the war and saved South Korea. This is the Battle of Incheon. On June 25th, 1950, North Korea invaded the South with the objective of taking over the entire Korean Peninsula and uniting it under communism. Backed by their Soviet allies, the North Korean forces saw great success in the early days of the invasion. The South Koreans were underprepared for an attack and lost territory every day. In response, the United Nations dispatched troops to prevent South Korea from collapsing completely. The combined UN and South Korean forces struggled against the attacking North Koreans, who employed a double envelopment strategy to cut off their enemy and force them to retreat. The North Koreans pushed the South Korean and UN troops further south throughout July and early August. Finally, in the southeast of the Korean Peninsula, around the port city of Busan, the UN forces, most of whom were American, were finally able to form a defensive line that the North Koreans couldn't flank or penetrate. This pocket of Korea became known as the Busan Perimeter, and it was from there that General Douglas MacArthur cooked up a plan to take the North Koreans by surprise and recapture lost territory. General MacArthur, who had been appointed as the commander of all UN troops in Korea, knew that the location of the counterattack was paramount to success. The way he saw it, there were two options. He could attack from the south and try push the North Koreans out, or he could attack from the coast and try and cut the North Korean supply line. Ultimately, he decided to attack from the coast. Attacking from the south would most likely have led to a long and bloody war, resulting in untold casualties. But attacking from the coast and cutting off supply lines would likely force a North Korean retreat. Choosing where exactly to land on the coast was the next challenge. Going behind enemy lines meant that the attack needed to be a surprise. MacArthur narrowed the potential landing zones down to the coastal cities of Kunsan, Chumonjin, and Incheon. He ultimately chose Incheon because he felt it would be the most unexpected. In his words, the enemy, I am convinced, has failed to prepare Incheon properly for defense. For the enemy commander will reason that no one would be so brash as to make such an attempt. But in truth, the enemy felt that way because landing at Incheon would be a nightmare. There were only two naval channels leading to Incheon, both of which could easily have been sown with sea mines. There was also the issue of the tides, which were fast changing and meant that troops would only have a few hours to land or risk running aground. Additionally, there were no actual beaches and the troops would be forced to scale sea walls to gain access to the city. Finally, a well-guarded island stood just beyond the Incheon Harbour. For these reasons, MacArthur's advisors thought he was mad for choosing Incheon as the landing zone. The naval commander of the US at the time even said that Incheon had every natural and geographic handicap. But the main reason MacArthur chose Incheon was because it was located very near the southern capital of Seoul, and he knew that, if the attack was successful, not only could he cut off North Korean supply lines, but might also get the opportunity to recapture Seoul. And since Incheon was so well defended, geographically and in terms of military defense, the North Koreans would never expect an attack there. However, it was a risk MacArthur was willing to take. Despite the risks, MacArthur eventually sold his plan to his superiors and got to work on gathering intelligence on Incheon. On September 1st, 1950, MacArthur sent intelligence officer Eugene Clark and a small team into the city. Their job was to see how tall the sea walls were, figure out the timing of the tides, and assess the North Korean defenses. To remain undetected, the officers worked at night and hid during the day. Most critically, Clark and his team gathered info on Walmi Do. 
the small, well-defended island in front of Incheon Harbor. They also discovered that the North Koreans had not mined the channels leading to Incheon. This meant the UN forces could make landfall unscathed if they played their cards right. Unfortunately for Clark, he and his men were discovered by the North Koreans, who attacked them at their base on Yonghong-do. This cut the reconnaissance mission short, but the Americans escaped with their lives. Some 50 South Korean civilians weren't so lucky. The North Koreans executed them under suspicion of assisting Clark and his team. With all of his ducks finally in a row, MacArthur was ready to launch Operation Chromite. To confuse the North Koreans and clear the way for the American troops, MacArthur sent out squadrons to bombard other potential landing spots. And it worked. On September 13th, American and British forces began bombarding the defenses on Walmi Do and Incheon. Two days later, in the early morning hours of the 15th, 70,000 American troops sailed up to the shores of Incheon in a move that resembled the storming of Normandy on D-Day. The UN forces split up and landed on three different beaches, codenamed Green Beach, Blue Beach, and Red Beach. The first landing occurred at 0600 on Green Beach, which was on the northern side of Walmi Do. The landing force consisted of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, accompanied by tanks from the USMC 1st Tank Battalion, one of which was fitted with a flamethrower. The UN troops outnumbered the North Koreans 6 to 1, and by noon, the UN had secured the island. The North Koreans suffered over 200 casualties, and the UN just 17. Even though the North Koreans had just lost Walmi Do, they believed it was just a diversion and thought the main attack would occur at Kunsan, much further south. This made the subsequent landings on Red and Blue beaches much easier, with relatively few casualties sustained. 20 were killed, 174 were wounded, and one man was declared missing in action. The landing caught North Korean leader Kim Il-sun and his staff completely off guard. He ordered the 22nd Infantry Regiment, which had been the unit defending Incheon, to retreat to Seoul to reinforce the capital. The UN forces marched on Seoul on the 16th, easily defeating the North Koreans in their way. They slew over 200 North Korean soldiers and destroyed six T-34 tanks. On the 17th, they captured Kimpo Airfield, the largest and most important airbase on the entire peninsula. Capturing it meant that UN forces no longer had to fly out of Japan to resupply and reinforce troops. They could do it from Seoul. The North Koreans tried to recapture the airfield the same night, but were unsuccessful. By the end of the night, the airfield was still in good shape and entirely free of North Koreans. From there, the UN troops made use of their new airfield for a few days, flying in the supplies necessary for an attack on Seoul. While they did this, more and more troops arrived at Incheon, and by the time they entered the capital, the UN forces were 40,000 strong. In contrast, just 20,000 North Koreans occupied the city. The vast majority of them were still farther south. The Battle of Incheon was over, and now the Battle of Seoul had begun. American forces entered the city on September 25th. While Incheon had been swift and decisive, Seoul proved far more difficult. Though they were severely outnumbered, the North Korean forces fought tooth and nail to keep hold of the city. It had been heavily fortified, and the house-to-house -house mode of combat typical to urban warfare made driving the North Koreans out of the capital extremely taxing for the Americans. There were American, North Korean, and civilian casualties during the battle, and many buildings and houses were destroyed. On September 28th, the last of the North Korean defenses were undone, and Seoul was officially liberated. Between Incheon and Seoul, MacArthur's force suffered only 3,500 casualties, with 536 dead, compared to 21,000 North Koreans captured or killed. The South Korean forces re-entered the city, and while this was a celebration for many, the retaking of Seoul led to the Goyang Gumjong Cave and Namyangju massacres, in which South Korean police murdered hundreds of civilians because they suspected they had communist sympathies. Though there would be more fighting and massacres throughout the next three years, the Battle of Incheon was a major turning point in the war. 
With Seoul in the hands of the South Koreans and the UN, they were able to slowly recapture more and more land as they used Seoul as a base to launch further offensives. The free South Korea we know today would not have existed without MacArthur's ballsy strategy. But what do you think? Would you have done anything differently? Do you know anything about Operation Chromite that we missed? Are there any other battles from the Korean War that you want us to cover? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.